Well, good morning, everyone. If you want to find the book of Joel in uh, first chapter, we had gotten down to about verse 15, 16, along in there. And we were on page 3 of our printout on our lesson. Down to down the last paragraph on page 3. We had been spent last time looking at the locust plague that had came and was so severe there in Judah and Jerusalem area and the impact of that and how that it was something from the Lord to to get the Israelites living there at that time to uh, think about their relationship to God and, and to uh, you know repent and, and turn back to Him and so so many of the prophets and of the Old Testament particular you know that was a lot of their message a lot of time you know Israel often got out of step with God and, and had to be called back and and uh, as we know from history you know the nation the northern ten tribes were eventually judged and carried away by Assyria and then later on Judah and Benjamin Jerusalem were uh, conquered by the Babylonians and, and some of the Jews there are taken off in captivity to Babylon and uh, let's let's look to God in prayer and then we'll then we'll get started father we thank you for this Lord's Day morning and father for your health that you give us and, and the blessings you give us and Father, the ability to come together. and Lord, we do pray for your presence and the work of your Spirit in our lives here now at this time as we look at this little prophecy given by Joel many years ago and help us to learn and, and apply to our lives. And We ask that uh, you would meet the needs of all your people, Lord, here today. Father, we just believe that as each person comes in that you know what's going on in each life and in each heart. And we pray that uh, whatever needs would be met, maybe some needs encouragement, some needs to be challenged. And Lord, we pray if there's someone without Christ that today would be their day of salvation. And Lord, we look to you to do great things among us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's read, beginning at verse 15 of chapter 1, and we'll read down through the end of the chapter. You know, last time we didn't do that for the sake of time, but let's do that this morning and kind of get our minds back to where we were at. Beginning at verse 15, it says, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the Almighty it shall come. And we talked about that last week, right at the end of the lesson, and, you know, the... Uh, this locust plague was was kind of a you might say a uh, not that it was a day of the Lord but that it was a I guess you say a precursor to it it was a something that was uh, telling the the Jews there that you know the actual God's actual judgment in a more severe way in a, in a more direct way would be coming if they didn't uh, respond in the right way to, to this event that was going on it says is not the meat cut off before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed is rotten under their clods. The garners are laid desolate. The barns are broken down, for the corn is withered. How do the beasts groan? The herds of cattle are perplexed, because they have no pasture. Yea, yea the flocks of sheep are made desolate. O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire that hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame which hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness. And so that chapter concludes with a you know, further description of uh, the severe conditions that were present there at that time. And so beginning looking at the last paragraph here on page 3. It says, Joel returns to the subject of the locust plague there in verses 16 through 18. You know, the Israelites' food had disappeared before their very eyes. And remember we talked about that and how probably a lot of them just stood and watched as those uh, plague of insects came through and just right before their eyes devoured everything and consumed everything. All they could do was watch the clouds of locusts probably numbering in the hundreds of millions, consume everything in front of them. 
And uh, the loss of their crops certainly resulted in a loss of joy, especially for the Israelites who truly worship and serve the Lord. And, you know, God's people, you know, the ones that, I guess the remnant that still believed at that time, you know, they had to endure this just like the others. And, and uh, you know, it was very difficult for all of them. And, and, you know, even as God's people in the midst of times like that, I'm sure that there's questions and the things arise in, in hearts and minds about, you know, why is this going on or what is taking place or how should I respond and so forth and so on. It says, here's a quote uh, from Ronald Allen. It says, The covenant that God established with Israel through Moses had repeated emphasis on the productivity of the land that was enjoyed when Israel was faithful to her God. You go back to Deuteronomy and under Moses and, and how God promised blessing for obedience and cursing for disobedience. And, and part of that blessing was that the land would, would produce uh, you know, abundantly the things that were needed for their livelihood as a way of, of crops and food and things for their livestock. It says, When the people would see the harvest and enjoy their plenty, they were to give God praise for the good land that was His gift to them. In Deuteronomy 8.10, a failure to give praise to God and live out His commandments in life would turn their plenty to poverty, God's grace into wrath. And a quote from Ronald Allen. And you know, that's pretty much the way God promised it would be. And that was some of the terms and conditions of the covenant that was given under Moses and, and for Israel and, and their obedience to serving God. And you know, we today, even though... We, in our relationship to God, is by grace. You know, when God blesses us and you know is faithful to us, how we ought to praise Him and thank Him today. Not because we uh, want to get more or want to uh, avoid you know His chastening or, or something. It's the fact that we should we should worship Him and praise Him just simply out of the fact that uh, who He is and what He's done for us, out of a real thank thanksgiving on our part. It was part of God's plan for the Israelites to link the worship of Him to the harvest of crops. They were to humbly recognize their dependence on Him and to thank Him for His goodness extended to Him to them. You know, just we're still as dependent today on Him as, as they were, maybe in a little different way, but in an indirect way. But we still are. Worshiping God should have been something filled with happiness and joy, because in worshiping Him, there's a recognition of the wholeness of life that comes from Him alone. And, um, you know, kind of brings to mind, sometimes, I don't know what it is with you all, but Tom will come in and he's hello, Tom, and he'll say, Shalom. <laughs> and, you know, it means more than just peace. It has the idea of, you know, is all well with you regarding your whole life. And, and you know, if everything is right with God and, and, and all that type of thing, then you can really say, Shalom. And, and, uh, <laughs> So that's a little <laughs> something you can something you can do, and uh, therefore, when the crops were destroyed, there could not be any joy and happiness, but mourning and humbly seeking Him with a contrite spirit. And that's what the Lord wanted from them at this point. You know, uh, to get them back in line, they were to be brokenhearted about what was going on, and uh, particular the conditions that were present uh, spiritually in the nation that led to the. You might say the physical problems. You know, the Israelites had taken most, if not all, of the seed they saved for the next year's crops and planted them in desperate hope of producing a late crop of food. There in verse 16, is not the meat cut off from before our eyes, yea, joy and gladness from the house of our God. In other words, they didn't have anything to offer to God, you know, the meat offerings and the drink offerings and the means by which they approached God in worship. You know, all that had been removed. We talked about that. And therefore, it was having an impact upon their relationship with the Lord. And um, then in the next verse says, The seed is rotten under their clods, and the garners are laid desolate, the barns are broken down, and the corn is withered. You know, um, when that first crop got eaten up and, and everything was gone and, and that type of thing, probably those that had anything left in the way of seed, they probably in a desperate attempt tried to, to plant something in hopes of uh, you know, having some food or something to get them through the, through the uh, winter time or the time that they didn't have any harvest. The problem with you see here in these verses is due to the drought and heat, the seed failed to germinate. Um, 
That's what it talks about. The seed is rotten under their clods. And um, at this point, the garners, where the harvested grain was kept, were empty. So all the resources, you might say, were gone. And, and not only the insects eating up what they were hoping and expecting and looking forward to, everything they had in reserve now had been uh, used up. There was nothing left in the buildings where hay were kept for the livestock. The Israelites suffered, li livestock suffered along with the people. All they had to eat had been removed by the locusts or dried up in the drought. So the situation became very desperate for the Israelites. And all they could do is turn to the Lord for help, which is what I think the Lord had planned for them to do anyway. You know, sometimes God kind of has to back people in the corner or a nation in the corner, you know, to get them to, to look to Him. And that's where he had Israel at this time, you know, the, or the, you might say, the Judah and Jerusalem and the people living there. He had them kind of hemmed in to the point they didn't really have anywhere else to turn. And, uh, you know, chapter 1 concludes with a prayer from Joel. And uh, there in verse 19, O Lord, to thee will I cry, for the fire hath devoured the pastures of the wilderness, and the flame hath burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field cry unto thee, for the rivers of waters are dried up, and the fire devoured the pastures of the of the wilderness. And so it was a it was a cry from uh, the prophet to God, you know, uh, maybe in, in uh, identification with the people or, or as an example to the people about the terrible situation and and their need and dependence on Him. He cries out to God for His mercy and help in the dire circumstances that they were faced with. He knew that it was the Lord alone that would forgive and save the nation from the conditions that they faced. And another little quote here says, To Joel, God's message was plain. The barrenness of the land reflected the dryness and decay of the hearts of the people. Accordingly, God has judged them. If, however, the hearts of God's people remained unmoved and unrepentant, a worse judgment loomed ahead. <clears throat> That's from Richard Patterson. And that's what God was trying to do. And you'll see this over more in chapter 2. <clears throat> and then we saw that back in Hosea. You know, God, is, things seemingly got worse and worse. You know, God, along the way, still called out to the people and to the nation, you know, repent and, and turn to me and, and be spared of this, you know, calamity that was uh, only, only going to get worse. And in this case, the judgment that would come would be in the form of the day of the Lord, you know. Uh, it's where people's hearts get so hard and, and so unyielding and so unbending that the only thing left is something severe. And uh, in this case, it would be the day of the Lord. One of the main lessons that believers today can get from Joel's prophecy is that God can use what is referred to as natural phenomena to stir in believers a renewed awareness of His will and His ways and a need for repentance and contrition and a preparation for any forms of judgment that God may send on a nation or on nations for its behaviors. And, you know, this morning, you know, there are some folks down in Texas and maybe Louisiana who are really going through a hard time. And, and you know, our prayers ought to be for them. And, and at the same time, you know, I'm even in the midst of that. God is trying to use that or intends to use that, you know, in the lives of some people. And, uh, you know, it may be, even for us here, you know, how do we respond to him regarding the needs of others? Or how do we think about that? And, and so <clears throat> all that goes on, and I believe we know that, or we, we certainly talk about it, you know, the Lord is in control. We often hear people say that in situations, and, and certainly he is. And, and <clears throat> so in light of that, as a result, believers should have no room, and I say that in underlined and and emboldened. <laughs> we have no room in our minds for terms like Mother Nature or Mother Earth. And, you know, that's part of the uh, terminology used by the fallen world in a world that doesn't know God. And, and uh, you know, this world was created by God for man and for man's use. And it's not something that they, they flipped it the other way. And, and uh, so uh, we're to have a different thinking about nature itself than the unbelieving world does. <clears throat> God may use the same events to get the attention of unbelievers of their frailty and soften their hearts to receive the gospel. And sometimes that's what God does. You know, and, and you know, there's things that beyond us, you know, certainly God's 
intellect and God's planning and all that he's about him is far above and beyond us. You know, the Bible says his thoughts are greater than our thoughts. You know, our minds can't, can't handle it and absorb it all and like all he has in his plans to do. You know, the biblical viewpoint is a God who is our, our creator and the creation that he made and sustains. And so not only does has God created it, he, he's what keeps it going and, and, and is actively at work in the middle of it. Adam was commanded to dress and keep the Garden of Eden back in Genesis 2.1. <clears throat> when God placed Adam in the garden, he gave him an assignment and uh, something to do. You know, Adam wasn't commanded to go out, sit under the tree, and drink lemonade. <laughs> you know, <laughs> God gave him gave him something to do, some work to do, and uh, that's part of God's plan. And said, so man has stewardship responsibilities before God regarding creation, and we do. And and you know, as as believers in Christ, you know, that's something that we should be cognizant of. You know, we are responsible to God for how we use. You know the world that he's placed uh, for our here for our use and our care, and um, you know we're to be wise with it. We're not to be frivolous with it. We're not to be wasteful with it. I always thought it interesting. You know when the Lord did the miracle and he fed that great multitude with that little bit of fish and bread, what was done with what was left over? It wasn't thrown in the trash. It was gathered up and, and for use. You know, the leftovers weren't thrown away. And, and so, um, you know, I think God didn't want us to be wasteful. I think he wants us to, I think, enjoy the abundance that he provides and, and to thank him for it and, and bless him for it. But at the same time, he didn't want us to be wasteful. He didn't want us to uh, misuse what he's given us. And so... Um, and I think when he blesses us abundantly, you know, we have um, big plenty and more than, you know, I think part of that stewardship is to, to help others when well, there's a need. And so um, all of that, I think, kind of fits into that role of being a steward of his creation. How should believers think about destructive events of nature, such as earthquakes and hurricanes and tornadoes and so forth and so on? You know, what should come to mind when we those events take place, whether it's something we're experiencing, whether it's something others are? You know, with some questions we need to think about, and often I think we do, says, is this event a judgment from God on unbelievers or a means of chastening his children for their disobedience? You know, sometimes, sometimes, not always, but sometimes that's the case. Proper response is humility and contrition before him. You know, if something takes place in our life and we realize that we're out of step with God, then there's a need to be broken before the Lord and humble before the Lord and repentant before the Lord uh, in those situations. And, um, you know, most of you remember, you know, kind of woke this country up back in 9-11. You know, when I think America thought we were pretty much immune from... Uh, anybody coming in from outside and, and hurting this country and you know we got shown a little different and you know I, there were people who talked about God at that time that it was kind of short lived for a lot of them but it certainly got them thinking in a, in a different direction maybe than they had uh, before in their life and unfortunately uh, it didn't, that, that attitude didn't last a long time with, with a lot of them is this event just something God allows within his creation as a part of the outworking of his plan without it being a form of his judgment or chastening? You know, there's another question we can ask. You know, it's not like that God is just allowing things to happen randomly and without his control. You know, uh, he is in control of it all. But, um, you know, the Bible tells us that the entire world and all that's in it is the Lord's. And, you know, everything that's a part of this creation is the Lord's. And... Um, all the phenomena and processes that take place in the universe by his design and are fully under his control. You know, from the very smallest of processes, things that go on within, a, you might say, an atom, and how the various components of that atom interact and move and work, and how that process creates other things and, and uh, the formation of other things and, and things we see go on around us. One of the most interesting classes I remember taking in, in college was called physical chemistry. And you know, I kind of have a better appreciation for now, but 
it's an understanding of, say for instance, when you strike a match. What all takes place when you break all that down? What all takes place in, in that little bit of action going on there? You know, the transfer of heat and what that does to the change in the chemical chemicals that are part of that process and what is the outcome of all that. And, you know, God put all that there and he under fully understands all of it. And, and, you know, it's there by his design. And, you know, man, we just kind of figured out a little bit of it <laughs> and uh, understand a little bit of how some of that works. And, and uh, so it's all there by, by God's planning and design. Every disaster may be considered by believers as something that God in His sovereignty has allowed to take place as part of a fallen world. And certainly, you know, we, we experience that in a fallen world. And I think sometimes, you know, the things that go on, maybe it's not a whole nation or, or a great group of nations, but maybe it's a certain individual that God's at work in, in, in people's lives. And the same event may be meant for something for one person and, and something entirely different for another person and what God's doing in their life. And God is all, God is all, God is all, got it all in His control and, and working things out and, and through that. So, and then is there something that can be learned from the event that points towards the coming day of the Lord? Jesus spoke about the beginnings of sorrows that were the first stages of the great tribulation. You, know, you get looking um, Matthew chapter 24, and you know some of the calamities and events that will take place here on the earth at that time. That will be at the beginning of that uh, tribulation period. And uh, you know, the day of God's judgment and removal from the world, all that opposes Him is coming soon. You know, God is working out that plan. And the destructive events of this world should serve as reminders about that time, which will be worse than anything else the world has ever experienced. And so, you know, we we see some things going on in our world today that are that are you know, can be pretty bad, pretty horrific, you know, for, for some people. And you know, but that just serves as a reminder to us that um, you know there will be some things that will happen, and this world will be a whole lot worse and a, a whole lot more destructive. And and it should be sobering, and it, it should be um, you know, causing us in, to, to uh, get ourselves humble before God, remain humble before the Lord. All right, going on looking at chapter 2. Um, we'll kind of split chapter 2 up into two parts. We'll look at verses 1 through 17 here first. It was kind of a shift in thought when you get to verse 18. And... Uh, so, and then we'll break this first part up into kind of two groups too. We'll look at verses 1 through 11 and then verses 12 through 17. And um, it's kind of how we'll divide it up. So we'll read verses 1 through 11 first. It says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. A day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, and a great people and strong, there hath not been ever the like, neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen so shall they run. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap, like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth stubble, as a strong people set in a battle array. Before their face the people shall be much pained, all faces shall gather blackness. They shall run like mighty men, they shall climb the wall like men of war, they shall march every one on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks. Neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk every one in his path. And when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb up the houses. They shall enter in at the windows like a thief. The earth shall quake before them. The heavens shall tremble. The sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. And the Lord shall utter His voice before His army, for His camp is very great. For He is strong that executeth His word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? And so, some terms here describing, you know, the, the day of the Lord coming. 
And we see here at the, in verse 1, you know, God assuming the role of a watchman and commanding the trumpet to be blown to sound an alarm of the trouble that was soon coming to the inhabitants of Zion. And we said before, Zion refers to often Jerusalem or to the Temple Mount proper or maybe includes some of the area around that city, you know, very close by. And um, so the, the alarm was going out. And that's what would happen in ancient times. You know, the cities, big, particular larger places or larger towns would be walls around them and guards would be posted and uh, all their job was to, to look out and see if anything on the horizon in the way of trouble coming or if somebody unexpected coming towards the gate. And if it was, then, you know, an alarm was to be made uh, where people would be called to attention and made aware of what was taking place and to get prepared. The call to send alarm is accompanied by a notice given that the day of Yahweh was coming and was, in fact, imminent. That's what the, we talk about the term is nigh at hand, means it's, you know, it's imminent. It's just, it's here. You know, it's the next thing that could happen. And uh, so uh, they were there, you might say. God is saying, you know, this judgment is right here. The day of Yahweh is described as a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And we talked about that, you know, in an introductory lesson, those terms for the day of the Lord and, you know, the ominous feeling that's, that's given. You know that, that trouble is on its way and something bad is going to happen. In this instance, the day of the Lord would not be an enjoyable event in the lives of the people who would experience it. And uh, so... Uh, we understand that from what's what is being said here. And that's what Joel is trying to get across to, to these Israelites that, you know, you don't want to go through this. You don't want to be a part of this. Chapter 1 gives details regarding a severe invasion of locusts plaguing Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. God declared that the effects of the soon coming invasion would be much worse than what had been experienced with the locust plague. And uh, there at the end of verse 2, it says, uh, this uh, day of darkness and a gloominess, a day of clouds and a thick darkness, as the morning spread across the mountains. And, you know, you imagine you in the morning the light gradually moving across, you know, in areas the sun rises. It says, as a great people and strong, there hath not been ever the like. You know, there had been nothing happened in the past like this. This is going to be worse than anything else they'd ever experienced. It. And then he goes on to say, neither shall any more after it, even to the years of many generations. So this was going to be bad, and it was going to be about as bad as it could get. And uh, during the event, it was the Lord's army that would be coming upon the city of Jerusalem and the surrounding area. There in verse 11, it talks about this. The Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, and so forth and so on. And so this was a, a Lord in a direct way leading an army to bring about this judgment, this day of the Lord. The size and strength of the invading army would exceed that of any other nation that had come up against Jerusalem before and any other invader that might come up against the city in the distant future. There at the end of the verse 2. And uh, so it's going to be something that they had never experienced before as a nation. And... Um, now, scholars debate over the type of army Joel is referring to. You know, uh, scholars go into great depth, you know, and, and you should say he's searching the scriptures and looking through what's said and trying to figure out what's being discussed. Some believe that he's declaring a much worse plague of locusts coming in, that is coming in the future. This is due to some of the features of the text. The description of the day being darkened. You know, you know, if you get this great cloud of insects, and you know, hundreds of millions of insects, you know, they're so thick to the point they'd block out some of the light. And you know, we've never I've never seen anything like it. And hope I never will. <laughs> but uh, some parts of the world they do. And uh, you know, talk about the destruction of the vegetation. And there in verse three. And then the comparison being made to a human army in verses 4 and 5 and 7. You know, the language says the appearance of them is as, the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, and like the noise of chariots. And So you have terms that are comparative in nature, such as as or like. And so they think, well, because of that, it's not a direct reference to the thing to which it's being compared. They think it's something other than what's being mentioned here. And... Um, the fact they enter buildings but do not kill anyone. There in verse 9. 
They shall run to and fro in the city. They shall run upon the wall. They shall climb upon the houses. They shall enter in the windows like a thief. And um, so they look at that. The mention of the army will be destroyed by God and being driven through the desert regions with some going towards the Dead Sea and some towards the Mediterranean Sea. You look on to verse 20. And um, the, there are ancient accounts of how strong winds entered a locust plague by carrying the insects into the Mediterranean Sea. You know, some of the scholars mentioned that. That you know, and I'm certain back in the old ancient times that you know, when these nations endured a plague to that extent, that there was some scribe, you know, recording that for history's sake, and and what what took place. You know, that's where we have. Uh, it's kind of surprising me, but you know. A lot of people back in a lot of those various kingdoms and nations, they were they were interested in recording what had taken place. And um, you remember in some of the other accounts, some of the pagan kings, um, you know, like with the, in the book of Esther, you know, the king couldn't sleep, which I imagine that was God-induced insomnia, <laughs> you know. And so he had the book brought out to read before him about different things. And I guess he was hoping some good old boring reading would put him to sleep. And there was brought before his mind, you know, how what had happened to Mordecai, and so you know a lot of things that went on back in those days were were written down. They were they were chronicled away, and so that's where these scholars they found documents, you know, or, or something etched, carved in stone about some locust plague and how that, how it ended, and so. Anyway, that's language that's within this part of the chapter is why some scholars believe it refers to another locust plague. Plague, locust plague. Now, there's other scholars who believe it is a reference to a human army that is described in terms picturing the activity and destructiveness of a great plague of locusts. And so, you have another group that that believe this is you know directly referring to uh, you know a human army. Other prophets in announcing the coming day of the Lord describe a human army as an instrument of God's judgment. In Isaiah chapter 13, there's one of those. And then I think as Isaiah 10 speaks of, of that as well. And so God often used you know, the Assyrians or, or the Babylonians or the Medes and Persians to, to carry out his will or his judgment on another group of people. In fact, God used Israel as a, as a, to judge, pass judgment on the Canaanites because of their sin. And so often God uses humans or human army to carry out his will. Generally, locust plagues in Israel enter in the region from the east. <coughs> However, invading armies such as the Syrians or the Assyrians or the Babylonians enter the region from the north. Isaiah 14:31 and Jeremiah and Ezekiel speak about that. And if you look at just look at a physical map, you know, you have Israel over here and the Mediterranean, you know. Uh, you know, to the west of the country and into the east, you get over in Jordan and on from there is nothing but, I mean, great desert. And so the the Babylonians and others that kind of lived to the north and east of, of Israel, they would circle around that desert because there's nothing there to sustain an army as it would move through. And they would they would move up around through uh, the north and then, then come down through uh, parts of eastern or western parts of Syria and Lebanon and all to, to come down through the region there in Israel. And so it'd often be from the northern direction which these invaders would come. And, uh, you know, if it was the Egyptians or some of them, they would, of course, come up from the south. The comparative language that's used in verses 4, 5, and 7 seem to refer to something other than human army. Um, However, in the ancient Hebrew, comparative language sometimes was used in reference to what is reality. And, you know, some scholars spoke about this. And, you know, they get all technical about it. And, and the fact that even though it's comparative language used, it's actually a reference still to what is being real, really mentioned. Terms such as like and, or like as or as as may mean in every way like. And an example of that they pulled back was in, or pointed out was back in chapter 1 and verse 15. For the day of the Lord is at hand, and as a destruction from the mighty it shall come. And so there's a comparative language used for the day of the Lord, and, and it's actually a reference to the day of the Lord it being uh, some dest destruction from God. So some scholars who hold this view believe that it is a reference to the Assyrian or Babylonian invasions. Others that hold to this view believe it is a reference to the great tribulation portion of the final day of the Lord. And, uh, and 
I guess personally for myself, I think it's you know some of some of the both there. You know, the, we do know that the Babylonians did come and and conquer uh, Judah and Jerusalem and destroy the temple as part of God's judgment. And and that the Bible talks about you know day of the Lords that are that are short or shorter in their span and and over just a more uh, certain portion of, of Israel or a certain portion of a, a country. And then certainly the final day of the Lord we know about as being you know, starting the tribulation period extending through the millennial kingdom and on through the great white throne judgment. And certainly the Bible speaks about that event being something the world had never experienced before and will never after. And so and that's kind of where I lean. It's one of those situations you can't be you know, just absolutely I'll die my death here dogmatic about and uh, but you know, I've, I think it's some reasons to believe that things the way they are. A small number of scholars link the portion of Joel chapter 2 to the demonic creatures that will be released from the bottomless pit during the Great Tribulation there in Revelation 9. However, their role there will be limited to tormenting the lost people throughout the entire earth for a period of five months. They're not described as being destructive like locusts in Revelation 9:4. You know, so I think that can be ruled out, you know, fairly easily. That vote viewpoint for that very reason. And uh, now, in looking at this army, um, it says whatever compromises the invading army, whether it's human or, or not, it is pictured by Joel as being invincible. The invading forces will not be hindered by any form of defense or barrier erected to impede its pr progress. The members of the army steadily move forward with each soldier fulfilling his role without interfering with another soldier. You see that in verse 7. They shall run like mighty men. They shall climb the wall like men of war. Well, what was the walls built for around the cities in hopes of keeping out you know, the enemy? And they'll apparently just they'll come right over the wall. Or, or whatever. And they shall march every one in his ways and they will not shall not break their ranks. In other words, they won't be interfering with each other or getting in each other's way. It'll all be very organized and, and, and everybody, each one doing his part. They will not even break rank as they cross over through defenses such as walls. They will carry out the tasks assigned to them and continually move forward. The source of the strength of the army is found in their obedience to the Lord's command. I thought this would be interesting. There in verse 11, For he is strong that executeth his word. You know, that's the, that's the power behind this army, is they are doing exactly what the Lord has directed them to do. And, you know, it reminded me back on Ephesians 6, Be strong in the Lord and the you know, power of his might. That's where our strength as believers comes from. When we are obedient to what God expects of us, then we have strength and power you know, from Him. And so there's a parallel there in that. And so a little reminder to us there, the, the necessity of obedience and, and carrying out the Lord's will that we might have His power and strength with us. Now the emotions of horror and dread experienced by the inhabitants of Jerusalem are likely mentioned by Joel to impress upon the minds of those that heard him or read his prophecy how terrible God's judgment would be. There in verse 6. It says, Before their face the people shall be much pained, and all faces shall gather blackness. In other words, it's going to be a horrific thing, a terrible thing. And it, you know, we see that in people's faces. You know, when some they get the news of, of some horrific event or something terrible that's happened that impacts their lives, you know, it often shows very much very quickly in, in the face of a person. Undoubtedly, there were some who doubted that the Lord would deal so harshly with the residents of Jerusalem to the degree that He would allow the city to be destroyed. However, God's alarm was given to the inhabitants of the city, which implies that the city was the target of God's judgment. And you did have those Jews who would not believe that God would allow uh, you know, the city to be destroyed or, or something terrible to happen to the temple. They just, they just wouldn't believe it. And, and unfortunately, they thought that while they were there in that area, they could get away with and do whatever they wanted uh, in regarding disobedience and, and not suffer for it and, and, uh, because you know, the city was immune to, to that judgment of God. The events described in verse 10 are some that are similar are predicted to take place in the tribulation period by the prophets Isaiah and the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Apostle John. It says, The earth shall quake before them, the heavens shall tremble, the sun and the moon shall be dark, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. 
you know, so this time will be filled with uh, signs and things, and you know, and the planets and the stars and the sun and so forth and so on. And you know, uh, Isaiah speaks of that about the day of the Lord and, and Christ when He's here in chapter 24 in reference to the tribulation period and His return uh, to this earth. Um, you know, those some of those signs are mentioned there. And then it's also by John over in the book of Revelation. And we see those same language used again. And so language used by Joel here is consistent with what's given in other places in the Bible. Whether Joel is referring to another severe locust plague or to an invasion from a foreign nation, God was in absolute control of what was taking place. And we see that in verse 11. The judgment that was coming would perfectly match the simple conditions that resulted in the Lord having to send it. You know, God's not going to judge less than what's needed. He's not going to judge more harshly than what's needed. You know, it's always going to it's always going to match. It's always going to be what it ought to be. And and um, and in the day of the Lord in the future, it's going to be uh, so tremendous and so severe because it's going to match and be what's required by Him to deal with the sinfulness of mankind and you know and to you know, to clean this world up, so to speak. Amid the noise of the conquest, the thundering voice of the Lord can be heard as a great general directing the invading army. It says, And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army. And uh, you know, it was back in the days before, you know, you could communicate by radio or or however else they do today. And you know, the, and often the generals would ride up front or be right with you know the troops and giving direction to to them as they advanced and uh, tell them to do this or to do that or whatever they were supposed to do. So we see the Lord in that position. A similar picture of the returning Lord Jesus Christ is given by the Apostle John. You know, when he returns and, and as King of Kings and Lord of Lords and talks about the armies of heaven, you know, coming back with him. And... Uh, it says, the members of that future army are great in number and filled with the power of the Lord. They were completely obedient and absolutely victorious. And so we see that from, from Joel here and what's going to take place regarding you know, the inhabitants of Jerusalem and, and Judah. And, you know, of course, that was fulfilled uh, you know, with, with the Babylonians. Now, verses 1 through 11 may refer to a day of the Lord that was imminent in Joel's time, which God would use to bring his judgment upon Judah and Jerusalem. Or it may refer to the final day of the Lord, or it may refer to both events. And I, I think this does, particularly the language about what goes on with the sun and the moon and, and those type of things. It refers to the final, or used in reference to the final day of the Lord. Some of the terms used by Joel and Dadley refer to the final day of the Lord. There has never and never will be another period of time in human history that can compare to that final day of the Lord. Joel describes it as being great and got old. It's from a word meaning to make large or to become large or something that's considered great in the minds of people. You know, there's events that happen that people's minds really take note of. And, and you know, it seem like forever cataloged way in and that's what this will be and it'll be something that will be etched in the memory of people and 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 very great and it's also going to be very terrible yare means to cause fright or to be held in reverence in other words to be uh cause to be awestruck along with a sense of terror and so it's a common a combination of, of thoughts there in other words, people are just going to be like, just cannot believe this and how bad it's going to be and how bad it is. It'll be such a terrible time that God will set limits on its length. And you go to uh, Matthew 24, 21, 12, the Lord talks about that. That the God will uh, actually you know, shorten that time. And if it didn't, you know, the entire human race would be wiped out. Joel asked a rhetorical question there at the end says who can abide it and the answer is or expect an answer is none apart from those graciously delivered by the Lord and so um, that's the way it always is you know, God in his grace you know will save a remnant and, uh, and that's where we're out of time and that's where we'll pick up next time <laughs>